how is the thyroid hormone synthesized? Now, what you need to understand that thyroid is essentially a concentrator of iodine. All, everything that you talk about, everything you discuss, very simple. What it is doing? It is taking in iodine and it is producing a compound which has got four iodine. So, which has got a huge, so most size of thyroxine is iodine actually. So, in a way, thyroid is nothing but an iodine concentrator in that perspective. So, thyrocytes are made in such a fashion that they form a follicle. And that follicle is something like you can say seminiferous tubules or that sort of a thing. You've got single line cells which are arranged. Inside of that is the colloid. Outside you have the vasculature which is there. And the polarity is determined. So, basolateral will have always the same and apical will have different. So, I'm showing one cell of a thyrocyte, the circulation the thyrocyte and on top of that is the colloid. So this is how the structure is. Now the most important work as I said is just iodine concentration. So for that there is a specific sodium iodine symporter and this sodium iodine symporter basically transports iodine along with two sodium it is transported. Now this sodium is then also managed by the sodium potassium ATPase. They will keep on fluctuating based upon that but iodine needs to be focused from our side. Now, this ensures that you have 20 to 40 times more iodine within the cells as compared to the circulation. Which other organs, Dr. Manoj, concentrate iodine? Other than the thyroid. Viva. And that is relevant when you do a scan. When you scan salivary gland. So, what will you ask? to avoid that salivary gland to uptake that. Okay. To feed, breastfeed. If the child feeds, then they will contract and the exposure will be less. So salivary gland also uptake iodine, which is important in that regards. Now this iodine, once it's there in the circulation, it's coming to the cell. Cell will not produce the iodine. It has to be pushed out. So there is a factory is outside. So this iodine will then has to be pushed even outside and there are multiple ion exchangers which will play a role here. One of them is the pendrin. The other one is anoctamin. There is a lot of controversy there, but pendrin is something which we know very well for a long time. This will push the iodine to the uh, colloid area. This is what has happened. Now, pendrin, where else will... Is it, what is pendrin actually, Naveen? It's an ion transporter. So when we talk about SLC, these are all sodium chloride channel transporters. Similarly, we've got this sort of a thing as well. So where else have you heard of its role? Yeah. Ear and? And tubules. So it's very, very important in terms of the renal tubular chloride bicarbonate. It's basically a chloride exchanger, essentially. So it is exchanging chloride to iodine here. It exchanges chloride to bicarbonate also. So this is the way it works in terms of pendrin. So a lot of people used to always remember Pendred syndrome. This causes hypothyroidism with deafness, with RTA-like picture. But now studies have clearly shown that most patients with Pendred syndrome will have an ear problem. They will not have a problem in the uh, thyroid. So, and this problem may actually come later on also. So while it is true that if you have uh, dishormonogenesis, you should think of deafness. But it is not true that everybody with Pendred will have a thyroid problem in that perspective. So this is the one which pushes the iodine outside. Now, once the iodine is in the colloid, you need to start then organifying it. So this is basically an inorganic compound. So to organify them, you have got a special enzyme which is known as thyroid peroxidase. And for peroxidase to function, what do you need? What do you need for peroxidase to function? Peroxidase. H2O2. So along with that, you will have another creator of peroxidase, which is duox 2 Now, why I'm talking about so much there? Because when we talk about congenital hypothyroidism in the next session, all of these disorders will come into the picture. So duox 2 with DOXA, which is a subunit, will give you the source of H2O2. If there is no H2O2, you won't be able to organify the iodine, so to speak, in that regard. So hydrogen peroxide is produced locally in the colloid. Now, from there, all the synthesis happens in a large protein compound, which is known as thyroglobulin. 
So now what body has done is that iodine is taken from the blood through the cells. Nothing has happened. You've got a complete chain which pushes it into the colloid. And from colloid, we have got these islands-like activity. So this is like a sea. You can say colloid is like a sea. And these boats or ships you are pushing in. And then the work is happening in those boats or uh, ships in that regards. Now this iodine will then go inside and bind to tyrosine. And binding to tyrosine, there will be compounds which have got single iodine or two iodine. There will be diiodotyrosine, monoiodotyrosine. They will again act together and they will then produce T4 and T3. Most produced hormone here is T4. T3, only 20% of the entire body's T3 is produced by the thyroid. 80% is by peripheral conversion. RT3, very, very minimal amount is produced. So now everything is done. Your material is ready. Your ship is ready. Now what do you do? You have to bring it back to the circulation. So what happens is a very interesting process of endocytosis, something like a phagocytosis sort of a thing. So the cell in a way allows this to come in along with the membrane. So thyroglobulin now enters within the cell. And now you've got within the cell, you've got iodine inside and now you've got all these compounds produced. Now, where does TSH come into the picture. TSH acts on the TSH receptor to do everything. First of all, it will increase the blood flow, which I'm not talking here. It will increase the blood flow. So your iodine supply will go up. Your sodium iodine importer will go up. Your TPO activity will go up. Organification, everything will be go up. And very importantly, it will cause a release of thyroid from here as well. Your DIT and MIT will come into the cytoplasm, which will then be acted via dehalogenase, you take off its iodine because iodine is very important. You don't want iodine to be wasted. And this iodine then again goes into the system. So there is no wastage of iodine which is happening at this point of time. Now T4 and T3, can they easily go out of the cell? Naveen. They can't go in the cell. So how they will go out of the cell, which we have discussed when we talk about the transporters. So what do you think happens here then? So you would need transporters to transport it out again. So like you have transporters to push them in the cell, you need MCT8, MCT10 and uh, other compounds which will push them outside. This is very, very important from there. Now, along with this thyroid hormone, what else will be released in the circulation? Thyroglobulin. So whatever is remaining, you have lies this part, so thyroglobulin will come in. So thyroglobulin is a marker of thyroid hormone production. It is just as like C-peptide, just like copeptin, thyroglobulin is also a marker. So if you have somebody who has thyrotoxicosis with zero thyroglobulin, what does it mean? So it means it has been completely damaged and everything has been released into circulation. So it means it's not an increased production. It's a release rather than increased production. If you have somebody with congenital hypothyroidism with a lot of thyroglobulin in the blood, what does it mean? Means there is a functional thyroid tissue. Which means that there is a thyroid tissue. It's not functional, of course, because it is not producing the thyroid hormone. So there is a dishormonogenesis, which is there in that regard. It's not an agenesis in that perspective. So thyroglobulin also becomes important in rare situations you will go from that perspective. So uh, we have from these lines, what all will cause congenital hypothyroidism if you look at this whole picture? Um, first of all, uh, Inactivity. First of all, the TSH, if we talk about the TSH receptor, if the inactivity antibodies come from other, they will hmm. inactivate the TSH. Yeah, so TSH deficiency, deficiency or TSH receptor problem. Awesome. Next. Second, uh, this uh, sodium iodide is important effect. Fourth. And this thing, uh, yeah, pendant gene. Pendant gene, then? Uh, thyroid peroxidase deficiency. Duox to peroxidase, then? Thyroglobulin deficiency. Exactly. Then? And MCT8. Then? And dehalogenase deficiency. Dehalogenase. And most important cause you have missed out is? That is, of course, thyroid is not there. That is different. Anything else? Out of this whole equation. What are the most, what would be the most common cause? But it may not be anymore. But what was the most common? 
So you need the, first of all, you need the thyroid gland, as you said. So of course, if there is no thyroid gland, no thyroid production. You need iodine. If there is no iodine, nothing. You need TSH. If TSH is not there, it is not acting, you will have severe form. Then if everything is there, starting from sodium iodine is imported to pendrin, to TPO, to deox2, to thyroglobulin, to dehalogenase, all of them can cause congenital hypothyroidism. And this is something which we'll discuss in more detail subsequently. Now, if your iodine levels are very high, what would happen to thyroid production? Because there will be a damage and uh, there will be decreased production. So, no, if it is high, you should produce more. But body does what? It will. So, if your iodine is more, what does it do? Down -regulate all it will downregulate the TPO. So, iodine excess will cause hypothyroidism. Right. This is known as not a syndrome, it is known as Wolf-Chaikoff effect. So if you have too much iodine, see body doesn't want. So it is very important that you should have mechanisms for excess. If your iodine is too much, you will become thyrotoxic. So that will become very dangerous. So body has devised a mechanism that if your iodine is too much, it will suppress the TPO activity and you will have the Wolf-Chaikoff effect. But suppose you've got long-term iodine excess, then you're always, you will become hypothyroid or not. So that also has to be taken care of. So to prevent this Wolf-Chaikoff effect effective actually cause hypothyroidism also, the body has developed another situation which protects it in that regards using the sodium iodine symptom. So long-standing iodine excess, short term, it will cause hypothyroidism, but long term, this effect goes off. Where do we use this in treatment? Wolf-Chaikoff effect, where is it used in treatment? Treatment of which condition? Thyrotoxicosis. So if your thyroid is very high, one of the good mechanisms is give iodine or whatever iodinated contrast, whatever you give. So it will shrink the thyroid. It will start for the time being, it will stop working. So it's an immediate short gap mechanism. But this long term, there will be tachyphylaxis, so to speak, that after some time, its effect will go off. But this mechanism of... Uh, the stopping of wolf chaikoff effect is not very well established in preterm neonates. Now, what does it mean? If they are exposed to iodine, what will happen to them? No. So, iodine excess will cause hypothyroidism. wolf chaikoff effect is there. But they are not escaping the wolf chaikoff effect. So, they will have persistent hypothyroidism. So one of the causes of transient hypothyroidism in premature infants is iodine exposure. So often drugs like amiodarone, people are using iodine to clean and all those things, uh, they will cause hypothyroidism. So prematurity is a risk factor and there you have a role in terms of the wolf chaikoff effect, which is important. So if you understand this, 99% of your congenital hypothyroidism and many of these other treatment modalities will become important. Now, if we go further, what drugs can you use? How can you inhibit thyroid functions? Suppose somebody is thyrotoxicosis, based upon this mechanism, what all can you do? As we have discussed, you can use iodine. Iodine immediately, which will block it. Second, you block the block the TPO, TPO, which is the organification, which is the most important. See, iodine coming into the cell doesn't matter. Unless it is organified, it will be lost in the urine. So best target will be TPO, which is which drugs? Carbimazole, methimazole, PTU, all those drugs, the thionamides are basically going to act in that direction. So these two will be the major mechanisms by which you can work out in that regards. Suppose you have a central cause of thyrotoxicosis. Central cause of thyrotoxicosis. Like TSH secreting adenoma. What would be the medical treatment you can think of? Then we can block the release. Of uh, thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone. Yes. So if you block the TSH, what will happen? Suppose you give antithyroid drug, what will happen in a central uh, thyroid excess? The thyroid will become bigger. So these are because of large adenomas. Suppose you block, give antithyroid drug, it will become bigger. The problem will be much more. So you then have to go back to what we said, somatostatin, dopamine, cortisol. So somatostatin would be one thing which you can immediately use 
to somatostatin receptor analog so that is the primary treatment of thyrotoxicosis in somebody who has a tsh secreting adenoma who is waiting for surgery that is very very clear which other drugs so we have talked about iodine iodinated contrast you talked about uh, antithyroid drugs which are acting through tpo anything else how can you suppress the tsh effect uh, you can give dopamine to so dopamine uh, cabergolin yes really but not required that you much so give cortisol if you give high dose of steroids you will not only suppress tsh effect you will also increase the now this is something which we will talk later about the metabolism of thyroid you will inactivate thyroid so steroids are the other therapy which you can use in that perspective